A.J.P. Taylor asserted Lansbury was the most lovable person in politics. A Liberal MP observed, the trouble with Lansbury is that he lets his bleeding heart run away with his bloody brain. Harold Lasky, not a clear thinker, but had a heart which reached beyond the stars, absolutely straightforward, absolutely democratic, and entirely fearless. An astute politician then, with a flair for organization and publicity, and driven by a complete passion for social justice, equality, and world disarmament. He was determined to find solutions to the problems faced by, as he described them, the people at the bottom of the pile. Born in Suffolk in 1859, GL was the third of seven children. His father was a timekeeper supervising navvies building the railway network. The family lived in hutted encampments built for workers in London and Kent. Finally, they settled down permanently in Whitechapel. GL left school at 11 to work in an office, but returned to school three or four years later. He was becoming aware of the unacceptable face of capitalism from witnessing the death and injury in work accidents on the railway and the terrible poverty of the people, including his own family in the East End. Father died when GL was 16 and he and his brother became the breadwinners, taking over their father's contract for shifting coal from railway trucks into barges. Back at school, two key events happened. First, he met Bessie, the 14-year-old daughter of a local sawmill owner, and they began courting. Her family didn't think he was good enough for her. And after a long courtship, they married in 1880, staying together until her death in 1933. Second, he found his faith. And Christianity, to him, was socialism. Bessie and George joined the Band of Hope. She played the harmonium and he took Bible reading classes. By night, he shuffled coal. By day, to the public gallery at Parliament to listen to the debates. If not there, to the Oval. In 1884, George and Bessie decided to emigrate to Australia to raise a fair, they sold their wedding presents and took off for Queensland to start a new life. What a disaster. Bessie didn't survive, nearly didn't survive the journey. They traveled with two siblings and six children. Conditions on board were dreadful and the family only survived because the crew shared their rations. Instead of the promised opportunities, Crowds of unemployed lined the Brisbane quayside. It was desperate. No work, the facilities and living conditions offered atrocious. Many young women were forced into prostitution. After various jobs, including breaking stones on the Gabba, Brisbane's test cricket ground, the Lansbury's returned to England. Lansbury said, I came home angry, a rebel against man-made poverty and destitution. I came home a feminist. He campaigned for government action against the swindle that was being perpetuated on thousands of immigrants. In 1886, government established an information bureau that offered reliable information about jobs and prospects in the colonies. <coughs> this was GL's first political success. He joined the Liberal Party, where his flair for organisation, public speaking and political nous was noticed. He was invited by MP Samuel Montague to be his agent. 
at which he was an outstanding success. <coughs> Montague wanted Lansbury to work for him for five pounds a week, plus the chance of a parliamentary seat. G.L. declined because he was starting to think like a socialist. He became agent for Jane Cobden in the elections for the newly formed London County Council. In 1889, the progressives won 73 seats, three of whom were women. The conservatives challenged the legality of their election and after court cases, the women were defeated and Tories took their place. To Geo's fury, the Liberal government failed to support a private member's bill to make it possible for women to serve as councillors. Working with Jane Cobden was a, a significant stepping stone in Geo's development. Gender equality became one of his passionate beliefs. Another stepping stone was his involvement in the dock strike and the gas workers union. These brought him into contact with emergent socialists. He took up the course of the eight hour day with vigor, but by 1890 had fallen out with the liberal leadership over the issue. So he joined the Social Democratic Federation, forerunner of the Labour Party, of course. In 1891, he was elected to the Poplar Board of Guardian, responsible for the workhouse. The workhouses were designed to desert, deter skivers and shirkers and humiliate paupers. G.L. was appalled by the conditions. No need to write, abandon hope, all ye who enter here, he said, sick and aged, mentally deficient, children, able-bodied and tramps, herded into one building. Paupers wore a hideous uniform of corduroy and blue cloth, no underclothing for men or women. One evening he inspected the oatmeal porridge supper. Mice and rat droppings were in the skilly. The chief officer challenged GL, who in turn invited her to eat a mouthful, and then he would admit he was wrong. Lady could decline, so he called for the doctor who said it was a mistake, and bread, cocoa, and margarine were served instead. George launched a campaign to smash the workhouses and find a solution to the massive unemployment problem. With help from an American philanthropist, Joseph Fells, Guardians acquired a farm which provided training in horticulture for 200 people. Poplar Council also established a training school that became a model for caring for orphaned and neglected young people. Then government set up a royal commission to reform the poor law. Geo was invited to join. He was co-signatory of the minority report that proposed a new national system for dealing with poverty. He fought three elections before winning a seat in Parliament for the Labour Party in Poplar, Bow and Brobley, but, uh, to give it its formal name. The battle for women's suffrage was raging and the Ransby family were deeply involved. He failed to persuade the Labour Party to support women's suffrage, so he resigned his seat, fought the by-election as a suffragette candidate and narrowly lost. <clears throat> During the next decade, he helped set up the Daily Herald, and later became its editor. The Herald was the for and of the common people. The Poplar Rates Rebellion, which saw GL and 29 of his councillors for refusing to obey the High Court order to collect the LCC levies for the police and other services attracted huge publicity. In the end, Lloyd George's government succumbed to the pressure and found ways to release the councillors and to generate more money for the poorer London boroughs. The rebellion brought GL into conflict with the Labour leadership, who thought it damaged their image of being a party fit to govern. 
However, the end result paved the way for government to take over responsibility for poor relief, and some argue for the start of the welfare state. The second Labour government saw GL join the cabinet as the first commissioner of works, responsible for ancient monuments and parks. Widely regarded as something of a nothing job, GL sat about it with gusto and his civil servant said he was one of the best ministers they'd ever had. He raised money from wealthy benefactors, which at his bidding was matched by the treasury to increase and enhance facilities for leisure and sport, and in particular, playgrounds for children. Opening Lansbury's Lido in Hyde Park provoked much controversy as mixed bathing was allowed. The financial situation worldwide was dire. Government was determined to remain on the gold standard and to do so had to reduce public expenditure by over 78 million a year. This required 10% reductions in unemployment benefits and public sector wages and tax hikes. GL and eight other cabinet ministers could not accept these savage economies and resigned. The second Labour government collapsed when Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald accepted King George V's invitation to form a national government. Many in the Labour Party saw this acceptance as a terrible betrayal. In the 1931 general election, Labour were routed and left with just 46 MPs of the 154 previously. GL never aspired to be leader, but he was elected as the leader of the parliamentary group <coughs> and led <coughs> a robust opposition. He offered to stand down several times as it became clear that his pacifism was at odds with the growing threat of fascism which required a response from the Labour Party. At the 35 Labour conference, he hinted this might be his last. Trade unionist Ernie Bevan launched a brutal attack on GL on this conflict of loyalties between personal conscience and political party. Absolutely, it was a betrayal, he asserted and absolutely wrong to be hawking your conscience from body to body. GL was demoralized beyond words by this and Clement Attlee was soon elected leader. From 35 to 40, GL embarked on a remarkable peace mission that took him to the USA and most of Europe. He met presidents and prime ministers in the USA, he addressed 20 major city conferences, made many broadcasts, and in Europe, he met Mussolini twice and Hitler and proposed a peace conference, a world peace conference. But he was exhausted. All this was a great strain on his health, and he fell sick and died on May the 7th, 1940. St. Mary's Church in Poplar was packed for the funeral. Not only family, friends, and the common people from Poplar, but also people of distinction from many countries. At the crematorium later, when his coffin began to move, someone started to sing the red flag and many joined in. At the memorial service of Westminster Abbey, the beautiful rites of his church were less moving than the singing of the red flag at the crematorium until, until a choir sung Jerusalem, George's favorite hymn. Let us create Jerusalem in England's green and plain land. After the service, the air raid sirens started up again. Half of Poplar was in ruin. Nazi bombings engaged in the war he tried to stop. Of his own house, in Bow Road, only a door frame and a door hanging on a single hinge remained. Thank you.